Welcome back to the French Rugby Podcast with me, Tim Groves, ex-Scotland international and adopted Frenchman, Johnny BT, and quite literally a massive guest coming on shortly. Is that what we're doing, Johnny? We've gone from Greg Aldrit to Paul Willemser to this week's guest. This one's possibly the biggest, mate. I think so. And I was going to say, if it is, where do we go from here? Different sport. I don't know. <laughs> Land mammals? Massive. I don't know. We will introduce you to him very shortly, but... Um, how have you been? How's your week? Better, mate. Um, so I was down at Beeritz Po on Saturday. Bit of a shame they got a uh, horse at home, um, but good to get out back to rugby. Took uh, my boy down. Uh, I've got Al Kellock here as well, um, former Scottish captain, Glasgow captain, my best man for my wedding. So his family's here on holiday. So we've been oystering, we've been caught to buffing, we've been whining. Um, and just trying to relax. So it's quite hard trying to keep up with some work stuff while they're here in holiday mode, um, but great to see them. And then on Sunday, I was also up at Racing against Stade Francais. Let's chat a little bit about the top 14 then, because a couple of the matchups there at the weekend are happening again and again. <laughs> which, can't, which can't have happened much, teams playing each other three weeks in a row. But you commented on the Paris derby on Sunday night. Yeah. And... Wrestling with streets head in that one, weren't they? It's that that like you just mentioned it. That's the first time in the history of the two clubs that they'll play each other three times on a trot. So it was quite cool to be there for the first act. Um, but it was one way traffic um, and a little bit embarrassing for Stade Francais, given the quality they have. Um, again, it was quite weird, even in body language and halftime talks, full time. They're still talking about transition, but they've got some quality. Um, but just in terms of physicality, use of the ball, the ability to hold on to ball in the right areas of the field, you have to be so detailed when you go to the arena because if you cough ball up to Finn Russell, to Teddy Thomas, who is a phenomenal athlete, like if you look back at some of the tries that he scored, he looks like he's jogging, he's traveling at 30 kilometers an hour. Um, you just get punished. Um, and so defensively, Racing were superb, line speed fantastic. They were exceptional. They absolutely boshed it on the gain line. And Stad Fronte didn't have the answers. Um, so it's going to be very difficult for them over the next two legs, you'd imagine. I was going to say, do you see any hope for them or what do they need to correct? Because obviously they're home this weekend, don't they? Right, they look deflated. I'm not going to lie. Like it was 50 points in a derby. Um, and that is the game that you should be, again, it's easy for us all. It's the game you should be getting up for. It's your local rivals. You're traveling 15 minutes across the city to play. Your prep's easy. And it was just lackluster. Um, and so I don't know. They, it seems like teams have sussed Ras S. They've seemed Stade Francais out a little bit in their attacks. So if you come up with an aggressive D, you put pressure on them, you put them under pressure and they sort of crumble. But they're going to have to find other types of solutions. Um Again, simple things like an, an attitude change, a body language change, um, but they just look uncertain in their game. And that's what comes across in the body language. They don't look settled. Um, so they're going to compete. They're going to have to change something. I'm not sure if it's... I don't know. Honestly, that's for, that's for Quesada. He's going to have to think about what he could do differently with the players because he can't change his, his first strings, his first string. The personnel is the personnel, but... They're going to have to change something about the approach and how they hold on to ball and attack because they coughed it up so easily and they just gave turnover ball to Racing time after time again and they got crucified. So they're going to have to be better in essentially every single facet of multi-phase. That being said, the set piece, they were decent. Their scrum stood up. The lineout was good. They had a platform, but they just kept coughing ball up. So have to look after it much more carefully and really test Racing, who were outstanding. We'll come on to some more of those Champions Cup round of 16 ties later on, but there isn't much doubt about the result of the weekend, is there? Toulon hammered Leon, 43-10 away from home. So what happened there? I mean, cra crazily, after where Toulon have been over the past three, four months, um, they're now sort of running a late tilt at the top six. They're one, they're one win off it, which is incredible. But key players back from injury, I mean, they haven't had Itzabeth, they haven't had Isa, Olivon came back, he was exceptional. Emmerich Luke, who I played with at, at Bayonne, the young fullback, has been sensational all year. Chesna Colby. So all these guys are coming back and they're clicking at the right time. It's been really difficult for them as a squad. Um, I, also, they, they're on a camp this weekend at Boiled Over. So they've got two players that have been, I think, potentially going to get sacked as well. So that there's been off-field tensions as well. But on field, it finally seems like they're clicking. Um, and it's been a long old year. They've had to change coach mid-season. 
but potentially now one win away from, and again, that, that a proper humbling again, to stick 40-odd points on Leon in Leon with Pierre Mignone coming to be your manager next season. That's a massive result for them. So um, it's huge, um, and the timing seems to be right. They also won't have too much pressure over the next two weeks of European rugby. Um, so building really nicely towards the tail end of the season. But even when they're going well, they still can't get away from off-field drama then. Do we know who those two players are, or is it secret? <sighs> I think one of them, well, they've released, one of them's kind of leaked it's um, Ori like really young, tough back rower who's strong as an ox. But it seems like there's been some sort of altercation. They probably had a couple of beers um, on their camp and, and it spilled over. So he wasn't at training on Monday. They haven't released the name of the other one. Um, so we don't know who it's going to be. But it, again, on field, all is rosy. But I think that's just maybe one of those incidents that happens and you have to get sorted out in-house. Um, but yeah, not not nice to, to see or read about. And La Rochelle. Won 16-15 away at Bordeaux, thanks to the EIOS penalty in the last minute. But all the talk about Christoph Urias and Ronan O'Gara spat on the <laughs> sidelines. So how did you judge it? Um, well, it's not Christoph's first time. No. Um, we saw the exact same thing happen in 2017 when Fabian Galtier was the coach of Toulon and there was a bit of verbals back and forth. And he, he went across and gave Fabian a, a tap on the cheek shall we say, but like he copped a 10 grand fine and he got banned for four games. So the fact that he's already got a record, he's done the same thing again with Ron O'Gara, that's dangerous for Bordeaux. With the games that are coming up, running into the end and the playoffs in both competitions, it would be it would be much harder for them without him on the touchline because um, he's such a big impact in the, in the prep and the motivation and the speeches. He's absolutely huge and crucial, like pivotal to any team. Um, but how it unfolded, um, Again, towards the end of the first half, uh, Bordeaux were plugging away. Um, La Rochelle come up with a big penalty and Ronald O'Gara's on the field. So on the field, encouraging his players, pumped up, shouting, screaming. And Christoph Urios, my old mate, has obviously taken exception and he's marched over there and said, look, mate, um, you can't be doing that. And to be fair, you can't. Like, you can't, as a head coach, walk onto a pitch. You can't intimidate other players. You can't go on and pass messages. So I understand but it's more the, again, getting straight up in his grill. And again, the best bit was seeing the look on Roger's face when he saw Rios approaching and the panic <laughs> setting in of what he was going to do. Um, but look, it's just something you, it's drama, but now it's how it's going to unfold afterwards. And then the post-match press conference, Urios was saying, look, you know, this guy is insupportable. Like, I don't know what, I don't even know what that is in English. Um Annoying, we'll just say. Really annoying. When he's outside the pitch, he's a pain in the arse. He creates shit everywhere. When he's up in the stadium, he's constantly crying, creating shit everywhere. I can't stand him. Um, <laughs> and he's like, he's, he's lucky that's all he got was a slap on the chin. So I, I don't know how it's going to finish. Um, but certainly from the outside, it, it was funny to watch unfold on the touchline. But are Bordeaux now going to be without their coach at the end of the season? That is the reality of what we're going to see. So, so we'll see what happens. There'll probably be a, a judiciary um, type thing demanded in the next two, three days, and we'll wait and see what happens. Well, let's have a chat now with a man who was front and centre on the field in that one, and we'll no doubt be looking forward to the next couple of battles with Bordeaux in the coming fortnight. La Rochelle and Australia second row, Will Skelton joins us. How you doing? Good, mate. Uh, good, to, uh, good to be here. Great to have you on, and we've got to start with that game of the weekend because we're going to see a bit more of that kind of thing in the next couple of weeks. As a first part of the trilogy, it was pretty feisty, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. It was. Uh, um, I've been a part of. I played Bordeaux twice last year, and uh, you know, it's always a physical game. Um, and especially it's the first time I've had a crowd there, and they're quite. They're pretty hostile. Um, I played there twice before, and um, the one thing I don't look forward to is the walking from the change room to the <laughs> to the field. It's I think it's like 800 meters, and um, my legs are always bone before we even get to the field. So. Um, I was glad to be able to put down a performance and be able to get through my carries and tackles on the weekend. I mean, it was feisty, but I think we were all left wanting a little bit more of O'Gara versus Urios. Um, did you see what went on and what have the boys been saying since? Because we thought it was awesome. Um, no, nah, there's been a bit of banter about it. Um, <laughs> I think uh, Kami, our boards coach, put up, a, put up an image of him slapping... Uh, 
with that Will Smith, I mean, that Will Smith, <laughs> Chris <right>? Rock, <laughs> yeah, and the Chris Rock thing. So that was up. That was a bit of last, but hey, I think it's just Rod's just trying to um, deflate the situation um, and steer it away from us. It's not really our problem, you know. He's a, I don't know, he's a proud coach. Um, we also don't know much about him, but um, I don't know. He can't be really slapping other other coaches, <laughs> even though he's at home. <laughs> But yeah, that's uh, something that I think Roger will deal with next time if he's got a plan. Johnny, you know all about Christoph, don't you? He's got a bit of form for this. Well, mate, he's done the same thing with Fabian Galtier in 2017. Yes, I've heard, and so he yeah. copped, a, copped a ban and stuff. So I, I don't know what's going to happen. But like you say, you can't be going around smacking people if you're Will yeah. Smith or if you're Christoph Urios. <laughs> like it doesn't matter. So it'll be interesting to see. But I reckon he's probably going to get a ban because, like you said, you can't be walking around just smacking people at side of rugby pitches. And in terms yeah. of Ro- in terms of Ronan and the the memes and the Will Smith stuff, is he um is he good for a bit of that? Does he take a bit of banter? Yeah, mate. Yeah, you know he is. He is um, straight away after the game. He um, I think he got he was he was going around uh, showing us a bit. He was like, oh, mate, did you see uh, Christoph after the game at half time? He um he slapped me. And I was like, when? Like all all I'm worried about is trying to get off the tunnel. Like yeah, rather than like seeing what my coach is about. Um, but yeah, he, yeah, like I said, he's just trying to deflate the situation and um, deflect whatever's happening with uh, with him and uh, Urios. I don't think that's a big deal for me or in, and for the team where we're focused on uh, on this week. But um, yeah, he does. Like I said, we had a bit of banter this week with the coaches and um, everyone's uh, and there's a, a lot of other stuff, especially with the England coaching. Uh, there's a few uh, God Save the Queen going around training for that. <laughs> um, so that's been nice. Mate, I because... love that. The, the fact that he came to the biggest man on his team and he's like, did you, mate, did you see what Christoph did to me? Like, if you could sort that out, maybe I'd be much appreciated. Again, going back to the England memes, like, has he had a bit of stick about that as well? Because I sometimes wonder if he, not if he realizes, but the gravity of his words, like the fact that you say that you've got like a three, four year contract with La Rochelle, but you say, you know, it'd be awesome to be part of international rugby, but it's taken literally. And then French media is yeah. like, O'Gara wants to leave. So again, can you give him stick for that as well? Or, or how does that work in house? Oh, man, that's media nowadays. I think like with it, whatever podcast or um, whatever you say to a journalist, you know, they can take another context or um, he might just be making a comment about how good the depth they have in the, in the country with the squad that they uh, squad that they put up uh, in every tournament, so um, they've got a great uh, they've got a great setup there in England. So, um, but yeah, like I said, like whatever you say, I could say that'd be awesome to coach Tonga, like, and then I'll be the Tonga <laughs> He's coach. Off. Like, He's off. Awesome. <laughs> We're clicking that up. That's oh it. no, I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think um, everything is that has to be a bit of context. But that's social media nowadays, so it's almost like you can't really watch what you say because. You have to say what you feel and what you're thinking too. So uh, I know Rod, he speaks from the heart and he's just, he can be very emotional and in, in what he says. So, um, yeah, I don't, I'm not too sure if I can uh, really say that's his goal. And you touched on his emotion and his drive. He was the exact same as a player. So, like, the history he has with the Champions Cup and with Ireland, can you feel that? Does it come across? Does he... Does he big it up even more when you get to European rugby? Because as a player, he absolutely loved the competition. Do you get that feel through his coaching as well? Yeah, definitely. Like, uh, last year, we well, it was my first year at La Rochelle and um, being part of Saracens, who've, who've built up Europe um, very much so how Rog has. Um, you know, it's a special competition. Play against the best players and, and teams in the world, in my opinion. Um, and yeah, it's, it's no different now. I think it's the only... Slight difference would be that we're playing the same team in top 14, we play them once, and we get to play them twice. That's so three times total, which is uh, I don't know if you guys watch a bit of rugby league, but um, I remember texting Kane Douglas when we first got the draw. Um, there's a thing called State of Origin, and yes. That's you, and for me, I, I, I saw it, I was like, fire out, this is like bloody State of Origin now, we're gonna play them <laughs> three times. Um, to see who gets, um, see, to see who goes through, but um, no, Roger's always been, uh, he's always seen this competition as a um, something special for us um, and as a group. And we did, 
you know, we we made it quite a long way last year, and um, hopefully we we can uh, build on that this year. And this is his first year as the main man after working under John o. Gibbs. So just give us an insight into how different they are, I suppose, and and what Ronan's tried to sort of, I guess, tweak more than make big changes in comparison to Jono. Um, I think I think for me, Jono was a bit. Um, John was a, a bit more behind the scenes, whereas Roger's really taken, uh, you know, every meeting Roger's saying something. Um, he's trying to lead the team. He's a young coach um, and he's trying to, I don't know, put his stamp on, on what he what he believes rugby should be at, at our show and how we should play rugby. Um, John was the same, but in his own sort of way, he, um, he let Rog uh, speak a lot, let his assistant coaches speak. Um, and when he did have a quiet word with you, was um, it was always something uh, specific to to what you're trying to trying to get done. Um, both great coaches in my uh, in my eyes. I think I like Jono because he, he had that forward um, that forwards background, and especially with the line out and the technical work that I, I wanted to get done there, it was it was really good with that. But then Rog, you know, he's got a uh, wealth of experience in his playing years and then also being at the Crusaders, you know, I think his um, ideology of playing rugby changed a lot then when he when he spent that two two years down there. Another man that's come into that coaching setup, Donnick Ryan, who was you played against them at Racing 92. How's he set how's he come into the setup? Is he is he coming well? Is he enjoying life as a coach? Yeah, like he's similar to Roger. Um, he, he left rugby straight away and just went straight into coaching. So uh, he's been our Ford's assistant coach uh, this season, and man, he's hit the ground running. He's uh, he's brought in a lot of um, technical work for us around the ruck. Um, he's trying to change our line out a bit, a bit too, because he's been a, a tactician down there at um, at Racing as well. You know, they've got one of the best lineups in the in the competition. So for him to bring that knowledge um, and that experience has been great, helping us. Roman Sezzi and, and Tom Lavo as well. So, um, no, he's been he's been really good. And obviously, two finals last season. There's only one place to go from there, and that, that's winning both competitions, which is a tough ask. But how difficult was that? Obviously, losing to Toulouse in both of them. I presume you absolutely hate their guts, like most other people at the moment. But it, how difficult is it to sort of re-motivate yourself and feel like we've got to go again? Because it was a great season, but it just ultimately the final hurdle. Yeah, I think it's. Um... I think it's quite easy to uh, motivate yourself. Like we want to, as a team, we want to be, uh, you know, we want to be lifting those trophies. We want to be playing in those big games. So um, for us, there's, that's the motivation there. Um, I think individually we have to sort of check where we're at. Um, and you can see our performances at the start of the season. We, in the top 14, especially we, uh, you know, we started quite slow and um, and hopefully we're building towards, um, playing our best footy in, in the big games. So that's in the back end of the season. And in those big games, would it be a dream to get to lose in another final and this time knock them over? If you could choose your opponent to get through and play, would they be the team you'd want to play? Uh, yeah, why not? Yeah, especially at home. Like it's in front of the Massa de Flans. It's, it's a great um, it's a great stadium, one of the best I've been at. Uh, and yeah, you want to test yourself against the yourself against the, the best teams and I think Toulouse uh, they, you know they're not having the best run at the moment but they've got the quality there that at the back end of the season they're always they always step up and I think that's where it counts mostly I think at the end of the season and Bordeaux are up there as well um, you mentioned it's like a state of origin three weeks in a row you'll never have experienced that before but as a player how do you go about that because it, I mean it couldn't have been tighter at the weekend Presumably, it's going to be pretty tight in the next couple of weeks as well. Is it tricky? Is there a lot of banter on the field saying see you again next week? Um, yeah, after the game, there is. You know, it's <laughs> like usually after the game, you say, you talk to guys you know on the team and you say, oh, mate, who you got next week? It's like, oh, I'm <laughs> you... playing each other again. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's, yeah, no, it's, uh, I think, you know, the coaches have been, made it very clear that they're not looking at it as a series. It's a game at a time, and I think with how the points work as well, um, our focus is trying to win. Uh, if you win this game and we win at home, there's no 
there's no there's no doubt there with uh, the scores and whatnot. So um, no, it is a it's something that we had to I had to think a few times when we first got the draw. Like oh shit, well we got bought a top fourteen and then play them three times. Oh, that's crazy. That's never been done. And then I looked over and the racing's doing the same, <laughs> and I think Connett's doing the same too. So um, it's not a uh, it's, I don't think it's that special, but um, it's definitely a, a tough opponent that uh, will be some good games coming up. And do you get more time off in the week because you're playing the same opposition? Because normally, obviously, uh, you'd have sessions sort of tailored toward you. Like, yeah. I know, I know what the plan is now. So, give me a bit more time off in between. Um, yeah, I don't think we're we. Well, I don't think we didn't specifically ask for time off, but um, I think just the, the way it goes, you play a team three times. Like, how how much can you review? Um, you can, I guess, if they've if they change their team dramatically the day before, but you know, you, every team has their own style, and changing players doesn't really change how they play really. So I think for us, it's just trying to be be fresh for the weekend. You know, it was a physical game on the weekend. I was I was really swaffed in the match. A lot of players were. So um, it's about I think recovery um, this week at the start of the week, and we really build up to make sure that we put out a, a good performance on, on Saturday. Toa Asa has asked us to ask you about your family, a man that you probably know fairly well. Um, but he said, can you tell us a bit about your family and that there are actually some bigger members of your family that are even larger than you are that are fairly handy <laughs> with rugby ball as well? <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I grew up with Toa. He's... Um, so my yeah, he's one of my cousins, my cousin's cousin. So, so it's pretty specific, and uh, it happens a lot in the Pacific Islands. Having uh, growing up different, so he's not my cousin, but he's a cousin's cousin. If that makes sense. Uh, but Tor, yeah, my I've got two younger brothers, Cameron and Logan. Um, twenty how old? Twenty seven. Twenty seven and twenty two this year. But yeah, I'm the smallest in the family, so. <laughs> They're both, no um, yeah, I think Cam's 6'11", and um, Logan, the baby's about 7'2". So they're big boys. 7'2"? Uh, yeah, he's massive, mate. Yeah. Oh, wow. I feel like I get bullied when I go home, too. So especially from, <laughs> from O'Gara's, yeah. O'Gara's going to be calling them in. Yeah. Did you see Urios? Did you see what Christoph did? <laughs> um, mate, whereabouts are they in their rugby journeys? Are they playing? Whereabouts so are Cam's, um, No, so Logan's not playing. He, he stopped playing when he was quite young. He wasn't really into it. I think maybe because me and Cam were playing a lot. Uh, it was, just wasn't his thing. Uh, and then Cameron played. Yeah, he's still trying to get there. You know, I think he, he just got married uh, a month ago. So he's been, he's just trying to get back on the field. But he played Waikato, um, NPC, County's NPC. Um, and he's slowly trying to get back into uh, some good shape to play. Um, some high level for high level rugby, but mate, they were really good players growing up, like Cam especially. Um, and he almost he had a contract with the Tars with me back in 2014 or 15, so he almost wanted to split and make his own, um, make his own way, and he headed over to New Zealand. So um, it could have been uh, me and him in the locks at, at the Tars, which would have been pretty cool. Terrifying, surely. surely. <laughs> Top 14, we had Paul Valemse on last week. They have a love oh, yeah. for massive locks. Surely boys, somebody yeah. can pick them up. Hook them up. Surely an agent's got to be able to find them a club in the top 14. Yeah, we'll try. I'll try and get it to La Rochelle. So a lineup will definitely only be four men and five men. <laughs> <laughs> and we had um, Ehio West on earlier on in the season, and he was talking about the size boots you wear. So, first of all, yeah. Are you size 19? And second of all, are they even bigger? Are they even bigger, your brothers? So, first question, yes. I'm also my boots, my rugby boots are size 19, but they're, they were like custom ones from Essex that they made me a few years back. Um, but I'm actually like a size 18. So, there's like a, a running joke about the D's wheats, which are <laughs> obviously 18 in French, but um, you know, they don't really use. I think it's, it's 50, I don't know, it'll be like 53, I think. Though, yeah. Or 54 maybe in, in the European sizing but um, and then yes Cam and Logan they definitely have bigger feet than me um, I think Cam he gets really nice shoes and tries to squeeze in um, size 12 smaller yeah <laughs> <laughs> I remember when I was younger my cousins used to say mate just cut your toes off you'll be size 14 
<laughs> and you were just kind of a hum. I was just people like stumps, but no, I don't think that helped me in the rugby, rugby sense. And Eho was saying they, they pass your boots around and put them on over their own boots and all sorts of stuff. There's lots, yeah, of, lots of that going on. They take the fist. Christy Arturitia is yeah, he's, he's a menace, mate. He's always putting his shoes in mind. Brees Dulan as well. He's he's naughty. He's having his power of oh, respect there as well. Why is this all the little guys taking the piss as well? Yeah, it's never the... Uh, we know, we know the struggles. So he never, um, <laughs> and Victor too. Victor's, Victor's about size 15 too. So he knows uh, not as bad of struggles as what I had growing up, but they know how it feels. I was the mix, mate in the dressing room like you mentioned a few of the characters there on field it's been phenomenal what's La Rochelle like as a club off field what are the boys like you mentioned Dudu Brice Dulin, Victor Vito you've got some characters there um, who's in control of what Roman Sazi you got three under caps the other day first time for the club a massive achievement but can you give us a little bit of background about the characters in the dressing room and how it all takes over so Saz is obviously the sheriff um, I'm not too sure nickname that but yeah, he's he's one of the oldest in the team. Uh, he's our captain, club captain as well. Um, sorts out a lot of the social events. Um, always around for a beer. Especially invites us. Oh, they said invite us once in the Or maybe <laughs> the other boys. Um, mate, Victor as well. Victor is one of the uh, oldest statesmen. He he sort of looks after a lot of the foreign boys. Um, you know, he's been there for a while. Um, Tawera Kerbalo, he's got a bit of banter, mate. He's a, he's, a, he's a funny old thing. He doesn't wear shoes around the club. He's always in bare feet. He thinks he's still in Hamilton. Um, and we've got the young sheriff, actually, Tom O'Bergeon. He's He follows and says his footsteps. He's always around them, um, which is nice. And he's got his little notebook. He takes notes of what says is up to, and he copies them a lot. Uh, but then, like you said, guys like Brees always playing pranks. Um, they pick on Joe Dante a lot too. Like, um, I wasn't here, but about two weeks ago, I think there was that sandstorm. Did you guys get it? Yeah, uh, still here, yeah. Yeah. So I came back and my car was just orange. I've got like a grey car. Um, and Joe was, so was, um, Joe's car was, was orange too. And they've drawn penises and, and written stuff in French, which has been like... <laughs> It's not play on. Classic. Uh, um, and these, yeah, so that's been quite funny. Uh, but no, wait, we've got a good mix in the club. Uh, I've got a lot, we have a lot of young boys who, um, you know, who are learning their trades. Um, they're always keen to ask questions, which is always great. Um, uh, and we've also got that experience, which helps guys like, like I said, Victor, Roman, wingy, big wingy, you know, he's, he's the King of La Rochelle, I think it's two fiftieth games coming up soon, which will which will be a big party. Um, guys like Jeremy Senzel as well. I think that mix that we've got at the moment has been great, um, and also trying to blood those young boys in because we won't be here for very long. You know, those guys are going to be the ones holding uh, the legacy of the club and, and and taking it forward. And obviously, you're back on the international scene now as well. Played for the Wallabies in November after a five year absence. Um, but we were hearing recently that I don't think you're going to be in the mix for the three-game series against England, apparently, because Dave Rennie's going to pick the three Gitto Law spots from Japan by the sounds of things. So how did you got, get told about that? And um, how do you feel about kind of coming back in November, but then not being in the mix, perhaps because of the top 14 season going on for so long, I guess, this summer against England? Um, no, that's, I think that's, I read something online, but no, I haven't really spoken to anyone in the Aussie um, Aussie ranks, um, but yes, yeah, coming back to November, man, it was awesome. It was uh, it was cool, really cool to be back with um, some players, some guys that you know I played with when I was back in Australia. Uh, guys like Alan, um, Hoops, Whitey as well. Um, man, it was awesome to be back in the environment and to see where Rains is taking them. You know, it's uh, it's something here to start from scratch, sort of thing. Um, was it with a younger squad? Uh, and you can definitely see that they're, they've got something special, you know. Um, and then uh, obviously, I haven't, you know, I haven't been told anything about England, the England series yet. Um, 
but yeah, hopefully I'll find out some really soon. Maybe you know so, some answers more than <laughs> I was gonna say it could be media talk. Maybe they'll maybe they'll hang on for you and see where La Rochelle go towards the end of the season and then make the call last minute. Who knows? Nah, we'll yeah. Oh man, I'll take some moving quite over me any day. It's bloody uh, <laughs> mate, some is killing it over there. Men against boys um, in Japan for him. So um no, yeah, I think oh, looking at the series will be a mate, will be awesome series with um, England coming over, they dusted us up uh, in 2016, which I was a part of, and um, yeah, it wasn't uh, it wasn't nice to get swept at home. So hopefully, um, the boys who were part of it do a good job for us. Well, mate, it was amazing to see you back playing in November. How did that return come around? Because previously you you turned down another approach to go back with the Wallaby setup. So how did it work out this time for you? Um, mate, I think I think Rens and so I played against Rens, just coach teams, Glasgow. Many times when I was at Saris, and obviously when he became coach, he'd see me play firsthand. So um, he was just looking at to create some depth for the, at the lock position for the Wallabies, and uh, myself and and Rory being over here, uh, I think it was a, a sort of no-brainer. We're already over here. You don't have to. That's one more fight you don't have to pay for to bring over another lock. <laughs> Save a bit of money <laughs> for Ari, but. Um, yeah, and he just we just kept some tabs on that. I thought I was gone because I was suspended at the start of last se- oh, this season. The start of the season, I was suspended for hitting uh, Richie High in the first game of the season. So I thought, man, I think that's probably me dusted. So, uh, but he kept in contact. Uh, he asked if I got suspended, and I was like, yeah, I did. You know, he sent, asked me to send him the video, and then I sent him it, and uh, and then he didn't reply. So I was like, oh, I think I was. <laughs> I think I'm kidding, man. And I think he's lost my phone number. But, um, and then when I got closer to the date, closer to announcing the squad, he gave me a call and said, we're going to name you uh, in that Springfield squad. And uh, mate, it was an awesome feeling. Um, you know, just to be named and then uh, to play all three were, you know, we didn't, uh, we didn't quite win the games, but it was cool to be a part of. And obviously he hasn't mentioned England yet. Maybe he won't. Maybe he will. But what did he say after November in terms of future involvements? Did he did he have a word? And has he has he kept in touch? Uh, no, not really. Nothing really. Um, yeah, no, nothing. <laughs> that was me, mate. My final cap in uh, in Wales and Tyler. So nah, no news is good the, news. Uh, <laughs> no news is good news. That's yeah, what I they hope say. So, I hope so. I hope so. I hope so. And another one, they wouldn't have to play. They wouldn't have to pay for a plane ticket if for the France for the World Cup 2023. Oh, mate, yeah. So how big a motivator would that be for you? Surely you'd love to be part of that competition too. Yeah, mate. Oh, just being here as well. It's like you said. It's easy if I'm, if I'm doing a preseason and someone goes down. You know, I'll be able be able to put my hand up and and be available um, straight away. But uh, it's still a long way a long way away, um, and it's. Yeah, it's definitely a, a goal to play another World Cup, uh, but something that's not in my control at the moment. I can only control how I play on the field and hopefully my performances uh, warrant uh, selection if, if they're good enough. We'll just clip that up and send it to Dave Rennie. That was the perfect. <laughs> You'll be loving that. And in terms of the overall rugby picture in Australia and selection policy as well, obviously it's changed a bit and it, it may change again, but... We're seeing in other countries at the moment, I mean, South Africa are encouraging players to go and play abroad and then still picking them. Italy, very different circumstances, but Kieran Crowley's very up for players going abroad and, and pursuing their career and then still p- picking them and having younger players come through at the other club sides in Italy. Um, is that something you think Australia should do more of, sort of encourage players to go abroad? I don't think being that direct um, is the core, I think. If you're stacked in a position and they say, mate, uh, look, we've got no contract for you here, but uh, if you keep playing well, we will be able to pick you. Look at a guy like Mac Hansen, who I don't know him at, at all, but a lot of the Wallaby boys uh, met up with him when we were in um, in Europe in last year in November. So, and they were just saying, mate, he's like, you know, he's one of the, he played 20s for Australia and now he's bloody Six Nations almost player like on the wing. Like he is one of the best players in the, in the Six Nations. So, I think for you will lose players like that too. I think if you start telling them to, to leave, um, but I think for me it's it was always opportunity, um, opportunity to to improve my game uh, with the best players as well. That's playing overseas um, in a different comp, uh, different weather, uh, different styles of rugby, 
Um, and that was my decision to come into Saris. Um, but then uh, in terms of telling players to leave, I think I don't think that's the way to go. I think um, if you have ongoing conversations, you'll get guys like Samu and um, even Marika now, I think too, I think he, he might come into the fold as well. If you're having those, that open dialogue with players, um, I definitely think that that will be the way uh, going future if you want, in, in the future if you want to keep those, those uh, world-class players who are playing overseas. It's quite a strange mix because they're I feel the way you feel and that coming to France and moving abroad made me a more rounded as a bloke because you get exposed to things that and pressures that you don't deal with back home, but also exposed to different levels of competition, different players. So I felt like as a player, I got better. But I guess for everyone that moves as a trade-off, right? Because I'd imagine if you'd stayed with the Taz and you'd been in Super Rugby, you might have 80 caps by now. But by moving away, you sort of forfeit the caps, but you grow as a bloke, your family lives in a different part of the world, you experience things and you grow in different competitions and meet people from all over the world. So like, how, how do you level up? Like, are you, are you happy with your lot? You're loving your life in France? You love being in La Rochelle and playing in top 14? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think, mate, well, there's always pros and cons to moving. Like I, I still had a contract, when I left in 2017, I still had a contract um, offered in, in Australia to stay, but, uh, and it was a decision for us to think, oh, you know, we can travel, we can, you know, when there's that, that week off, like we can literally go to Europe anywhere and fly somewhere within two hours, you know, cheap tickets. Um, I think also we grew as a, as a couple, as a married couple too, uh, which was really cool. Um, and then on the, on the other side with the rugby, like, uh, I was very fortunate to, to land this Aries being the powerhouse that it was, um, that it is at the moment that, you know, I was probably a part of the golden years. Um, we won a prem when I first came. The next year we won the double and then the salary stuff happened. So um, I left on uh, not my terms, but um, to come to France, it was always a goal to, to, to play over here, to try and learn the language, experience um, life in France. It, it, it's been really cool, uh, really awesome in uh, the last year that we've been here. And the three leagues are obviously very different. Super Rugby, you did very well in. And then you mentioned the Premiership, you were with Saracens, going over to France, the top 14. They've all got different points about them. Um, first of all, have you got a preference, presumably, the top 14 now, because you're there, there at the moment. But <laughs> they are all very different. Is it true when you joined Saracens, they, they put you on a special regime, you lost about 20 kilos. Um, have you put some of that back on now to play in, to play in France? How do they sort of differ in terms of how you have to be, I guess. So when I came to, when I landed at Sarri, so when I left, I, I was at one, when I first got up, I went there on loan first. So I got a taste of what it was like. I played eight games for the club. Played uh, played in Europe, which was really cool. I played against Sale and we went out to Scarlet too, which was, which was a different, uh, different experience. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I got a taste of it. And I think I was about 140. And then I, just before, and then I signed for two years. But I broke my I broke my arm a month before I had to be in England, so I hadn't done any training with all the excuses straight off the flight, put on six kgs from the flight, all the business class food, <laughs> <laughs> no water retention it was all the water retention I think, um, and I, yeah I jumped on almost at one sixty I think, and they were Oof. just like oh wow, um, yeah that's not going to be play on so I. Um, yeah, I've still got great relationships with the coaches and the trainers there. And yeah, we just went out, went to work. That first season, I was pretty injury prone. I hurt my, I broke my arm again. Um, and yeah, just uh, it wasn't a specific regime. It was just what they had at the time. It was just try, trying to train harder and get back to where I was before I left. And so, is it similar now? Then you're, you're still around the same way. It's not like top fourteen. You have to be a bit heavier, or it's just what? that's your. Mate, they'd, they'd have you at 175 if they could they'd be like mate <laughs> get him back on business class get that water retention no, <laughs> no not Rog mate Rog hey, I'm too heavy but no I mean I'm sitting around the, around the same but between 145 and 150 I try and float uh, try and be as light as I can uh, actually I was talking to Kieran Brooks after we played them at home first time I don't really know him well but I played against them at, uh, when you played for Wasps in Northampton um it's funny how you, whenever you see someone who's 
the foreigner, he's, hey, he's gravitate towards him. And, hey, man, that's a family. Like, well, I've never met this guy before. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I was speaking to him, he's like, man, I've actually lost, I've lost weight. I was like, man, how do you lose weight? I think they're running 8K, they're doing 8K days down in Toulon before, um, before they let go of their coach before. So um, that, will, that will do it. And you've signed up with La Rochelle, is it 2025? Your contract's up till? Yeah, so, 2025, yeah. So, I mean, that's a, that's a big deal. So you're obviously loving life there. What's the, Johnny mentioned the mix of players and, and Johnny loves to talk about how, where he lives and like, I try and ignore his Instagram, <laughs> it's beach after beach after beach. Um, but yeah, what's the best thing about life in France? Um, I think just being by the sea, where La Rochelle, it's a small town on the West Coast. Um, when we first, came and visited uh, the president took us to his house and first thing on the plate was uh oysters and my wife like just looks at me and goes, oh, i think we have to sign here um so yeah they were well known for their oysters and their seafood and um no yeah we really enjoy just the lifestyle here it's not as hectic as north london where we were um, in st albans there but um yeah we've made some good friends here and um, like I said, the people they get around you, they love they love the club, they love um, you know they love their team, and um, they're very respectful when we're out. And um, yeah, no, it's it's a, it's a great place to live. It's an amazing part of the world, and they're lucky to have you. And well done signing 2025. That's phenomenal. Um, yeah, looking ahead quickly, the next couple of weeks. Again, we've talked about the first part of the trilogy. Now got the second and third acts to follow. What is going to be key to getting through this next round of competition? What are you going to have to do to get one over Bordeaux in these next two games? Um, what have you targeted? What did you target that worked well in the first game? But what do you have to do to get through the next two rounds? Yeah, I thought I thought a positive was our defence um, on the weekend. I think that's a standard we had to keep. Um, you know, they had a lot of ball, and we I think we made like two hundred fifty tackles or something like that. We had Vian Liebenberg made twenty five tackles, which is um, bloody rugby league step there. That's you know that was that was a uh, massive for us. Um, so I think our defence has to keep there. But then also in attack when we have the ball, I think we have to take opportunities. I think we were in their zone twice in the, in the first half and we scored two tries. But then anywhere around the around the fifty meter mark, we couldn't hold on to the ball. Myself included. Um, they went hard at our ruck, uh, and Johnny would love that sort of stuff. You know. Diaby and Waki just putting the head in, sticking the head in, pick and mold as well. So uh, we've, we've had a big focus on that this week. Um, and not only the focus on our cleaners, but our ball carrier, making sure that he's not um, dead on the ground. You know, he's working hard um, and just having more options in attack. I think we were, I don't know, maybe it sapped us, our, our D, but as soon as we got the ball, we had to show that excitement and, and that, that love to, to play that we usually have. And obviously we don't see these two-legged home and away ties in rugby very often at all. And they're commonplace in football. And often you hear about, so if you've got the away leg first in Bordeaux, you hear you go over there, keep it tight. You know, even if you lose, don't lose by much. I'm sure that won't be your approach. You'll be trying to win the game. <laughs> but has there been talk of that from, from Ronan and right at the top, sort of, you know, make sure you keep it tight. And then obviously, you know, you've got the fans home leg, Second, no, no, not at all. Um, he's made it pretty clear that it's a, a game that we want to express ourselves. I think, I think the weather will dictate how, how the game, how the score goes, because I think it's going to be wet. I'm pretty sure it's going to be wet. So, um, no, but yeah, he hasn't had he, the coaches haven't said much right, about that sort of stuff. It's, it's very much looking on how we can improve on last week's win. Um, because, and they also said, you know, like, if you hire Mr. Kick, like, the mood would be very different to, the ambience would be very different um, at the start of the week than what we've had. So I think we just have to reflect and, um, and not get too far ahead of ourselves on um, and, and try and back up that performance. Well, massive good luck in the second and third installments of the trilogy. And we'll clip that bit up as well and send it to Dave Rennie. So good luck at the 2023 <laughs> World yeah, Cup. Thanks. thanks. <laughs> a great for me, great. Awesome. Cheers, Best luck this weekend, Well, Cheers. Cheers, boys. Thank you, mate. We laughed about it at the end, Johnny, but very interesting. No call from Dave Rennie yet, but um, he's putting his oh. hand up for sure. 
No news, good news. That's what I always used to tell myself. And then I didn't get picked, but will will get picked because he's class and different level. Um, and he was a bit um self depreciating there, but he was excellent again at the weekend. Like he's been monstrous for them since he arrived. Um, and so it would be awesome, especially for the French based boys, you know, to be playing for La Rochelle and then to be, you know, getting down to Bordeaux, representing Australia. There's games in Paris as well for them. Um, it'd be huge. But it was just great to get a little bit of insight into the club, the operations, how it goes behind the scenes. Um, and yeah, two massive games coming up for them over the next couple of weeks. So that was great to have him on, an absolute legend. And his brothers are even bigger than him. <laughs> I wanted to, I was like, you've, you've to, you told us about your cousin's cousins. I'm like, have you got any Scottish grandparents? <laughs> they fancy a three-year holiday in Edinburgh. We'll get them on residency. Um, seven foot two. Seven foot two, that is freakish. Like Richie, like one of the best mates I played, Richie Gray, six foot 10 playing with him you're like he almost wasn't human he was that large so to be seven foot two <laughs> I mean that is just ridiculous so fingers crossed and he mentioned one of them was also playing at the war Taz with him and is a handy footballer played an NPC as well so you know hopefully somebody picks him up I mean somebody that big can do a job somewhere especially in France so freakish that is freakishly big Right, we'll look ahead to the Champions Cup round of 16 ties a little bit more very shortly, but it's about time we did our meter moment of the week, isn't it? So do you want to take it away, Johnny? Yep, it comes from Leon against Toulon as well. Um, Toulon back to being decent again, and a moment from Cheslin Colby of absolute madness from Leon. But again, they win a penalty. Baptiste Saran just wants to simply go and kick the ball to touch. He misses touch. Nakatasi keeps the ball in. And Cheslin Colby, simple things. Again, we talk about his footwork, his freakishness, but just chasing the ball down the touchline. Manages to snaffle the ball, beats both men and gets over to dot a try down. So a massive piece of play from him and quite easily our meter moment of the week. And Cheslin wasn't on the beers and getting sacked, no? It wasn't Cheslin. <laughs> He's too good for that, is Ches. He probably was, but he definitely isn't getting sacked, that's for sure. Not on that contract. <laughs> That was Johnny's Meter Moment of the Week, and Meter is the world's number one wireless meat thermometer, recently making over 11 million cooks better with their game-changing app and completely wireless Bluetooth meat probe. You can use it on a barbecue, in the oven, or in a pan, and you can get your hands on one at meter.com. Plus, you can get 10% off any full-price item with the code FRENCHPOD10 at checkout as well. Champions Cup, round of 16. We've discussed... A little bit, the all French ties, but Toulouse, Montpellier, and Clermont, they all have the home leg first and then have to travel away to Ulster, Quinns, and Leicester, respectively. Mm -hmm. How big a deal do you think that is? is? Is it a real advantage to have the home leg second? And how do you think those three will get on? I think it's an advantage to have the home game first. Really? Um, I, I do, yeah, especially I look at a team like Toulouse, for instance, who have stuttered while their internationals have been away. They just beat Leon last week. They lost against Cast this weekend. I'm like, for them, the comfort of being home and hopefully things clicking is actually really important. Um, you get the feeling if they went away and it, it went really wrong and they were chasing a big score after a big loss, it'd be much more difficult. Um, I don't know, but then chatting to Will, he also takes it like La Rochelle's a well-oiled machine. They haven't missed too many of their internationals. Them, it's every game at a time. So... I don't know. I think like Montpellier being at home to Quinns, that's a big chance to, to knock up a score. Um, the way they dismantled Exeter, they've shown that they can take on that level of competition and build confidence into going away from home, which traditionally in France is a bigger of a deal. Um, and for Toulouse as well, I think it's super important. Um, Claremont as well, Leicester for them will be an unknown quantity. They're missing Damian Peno. But I think the French-based games, so... Bordeaux, La Rochelle will be extremely tight. Stade Francais, Racing, I think that looks like it's going to be potentially one-way traffic again, even though it's at Jean Bouin. Um, but you're looking for Clermont, Montpellier and Toulouse to post wins at home this weekend and give themselves the best chance when they go away from home next week. Um, so I think those are really key for those, that the home games and the home ties um, will determine, I think, their attitude and their appetite going away from home in the, in the second round. And Montpellier Quinns is perhaps the most interesting clash of styles because you've got huge physicality in Montpellier and we know Quinns are not going to change the way they play. They're going to chuck the ball around and try and play expansive rugby. So how do you see it going? 
I don't know. Again, I look back to that extra game and just the sheer physicality. So what we see with the French side, you now got Montpellier who are flying high, leading the top 14, brutal in the collision area. I mean, they have dominated most sides in the top 14 this year, which is not easy. Um, against Quinns, who can mix it, play an exciting brand of rugby, but if they don't win any of the physical edges, like Exeter couldn't, it could be very difficult for them um, in Montpellier this weekend. So I would say Montpellier are heavy favourites for that game. Um, heavy might be a bit much, but I'd say they're definitely favourites for that game, considering how they're going, how their confidence is. They're winning everywhere. They won in Perpignan at the weekend as well. Um, but that being said, like you look at Marcus Smith and these boys, Danny Kerr as well, the way they're playing in the Premiership at the minute, they can pull off anything. So I'm really looking forward to that game. I'll be down there with BT. Um, and yeah, it should be really interesting how that turns out, actually. A, a big game of rugby coming up there. And just a very quick one before we go. We chatted to Paul Willemser about Alex Ruiz going from ref to coach with Montpellier last week. Now Roman Poit is doing the same, isn't he, with too long? I think they're all going to go that way. They'll be better played. They'll be better paid moving in to the private sector. Can we say that? The private sector, moving out of the public sector, working there for the FFR and moving into the private sector, working for Moet Altrat. Um, Roman Poit, again, coming to the end of a refereeing career. I mean, why not? I don't know if it's going to be your just refereeing in-house or if he's going to become a coach like Alex Ruiz, but there are certainly roles like at Bayonne and Cass, we had referees in all the time, but they were given, they were at our disposition by the Federation. But where they're having somebody in every single day to help with disciplinary issues, to help with uh, 15 on 15 training days for, for contact days, if it's a full-time role purely in a referee domain or if they become a coach, that that's the interesting bit. So I, I don't know, but Again, Alex Ruiz has started what I think is going to be a trend and we're going to see it more and more in France. Thanks, Johnny. A big thanks to Will Skelton for joining us and a massive thanks to all you guys for listening as well. Make sure you hit subscribe, leave us a review if you can as well. Check us out on Rugby Pass and on YouTube and we'll be back with another episode next week. Au revoir, Johnny. Cheers, Tim. Bye.